Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Nick Salemo from Croatia. He graduated from the veterinary faculty of the University of Zagreb, and since 2001, he has worked as an assistant in the Department of Internal Medicine. In order to gain experience as part of his specialization, he spent a post-residency fellowship at North Carolina State University in 2010. He's currently a full professor and head of the clinical division at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine in Zagreb, an FCI international judge and breeder of schnauzers. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. And actually, first apologize. Yesterday, I had an accident. I fell down in the Mexico City Reforma Street, and I have really pain in my leg and the cramp. So if I start feeling cramp or the pain, I will take a seat. So don't feel that something is wrong with me, but I will do my best. I don't have conflict of interest because I will not speak about treatment of uh, this syndrome. I will, I do lecture as approach for breeders, judges, and the basic for veterinarians. Because today I will, I'm not the person who will speak about disease. Everybody speak about different topics. So I think that this is a difficult to find the level that you will understand what is the problem in this very um, hot topic nowadays in the dog world. So our outline of this topic will be brachycephalia as a medical term, physiology of respiratory system, pathology of BOAS, and preventive medicine and the future breeding program. About terminology, when we speak about how brachycephalic develop as a terminology. We have a cephalo came from the kephale in the Greek, from the Greek language, and then when we want to say something about brachycephalic or something that we use brachycephaly, brachycephalic, and brachycephalus. Actually, 75% of the medical terminology came from the Greek origin they developed first medicine. And then later in the 18th and 19th century, we involved the Latin language. So this, this we use the Greek basis, and then we have a little bit, two similar words, one from Latin, one from Greek. Brachy, it's like, like a forearm. And we took the, when we took the blood from the dog, we use usually like a, um, like uh, veins uh, related, like a brachialis. But brachy, on this way, like a short Greek, means short, we use and compose the word brachycephalic. Some people, we, you know, when we have the Latin and Greek in the medical term, we can pronounce it a different way. So I will do brachycephalic. I see that... Uh, our president Thomas used brachycephalic. Also, it's correct. If you do like people do brachycephalic, some because in Spanish language they put Q and then they call brachycephalic. This terminology came from the first from the human medicine, actually, and then we apply in the veterinary medicine, but with a different index. So this is evidence-based medicine, and this is the published in the mall articles uh, from anthropology. When we study skulls in the human, what we find in the, in the some burial place or something like that, and we have this index from females and males, and then they form dolicocephalic, mesatocephalic, and brachycephalic. Why it's important? Because due evolution, we want to see how we change. And the most from history, we find a skull. So it was very interesting to watching how some population or some race of the human change through the, through the history. But measuring a cephalic or cranial index is very simple. Hand leg and head breath, and then head breath divide with hand leg, where it's 100. So we have this index here. So if we have, for example, 20 centimeter long bre uh, head breath and 20 centimeter long head divided by 100, it will be 100. 
almost. They help us in human medicine because they do validation how to do cephalic index. So the different simple caliper. Now with this, we have the we can buy caliper, digital caliper for 15 euros uh, over the internet. And we have this old one. We have computer tomography 2D, we have 3D, we have other plastic methods or something like that, because they just want to validate it that they can use this information in the future evidence-based medicine, how they can compare results between two different research. And then when I study a little bit more about human brachyce brachycephaly, dolicocephaly, mesotocephaly, it's very pop up this really interesting article from 2020 about uh, Korean people. They do research. I just will explain you, and they have historical brachycephalization and recent debrachycephalization as a terminology. What it means, if you see this diagram, this is the age of the people. Here, 10 to 17, 10 to 17, 10 to 17, 10 to 17. This is the length of the head, breadth of the head, and this is index, calculated between this. This research is take, for example, in the 2015, so it means in this time, you see that male population losing the length of the head. It means that breadth of the hand more dominant. In the females, the little bit go down, and then in the almost on the age of the 35, going back. So on the breath, usually similar things, except that we stop here on the also 35, so we don't know what's happened in the 70s in Korea. Why they switch from brachycephalization to debrachycephalization is interesting. And when you watch the index, index the growing and then stop and then going down. It was also in the, in the history finding. Oh, I had the chance to visit the Anthropology Museum uh, two days ago in the Mexico city. It's a beautiful. And then we can see ancient civilization and the skulls and how they present them in the, in the museum. And then, when I search about Boas, and when you put the Boas in scientific literature, we found one professor from Germany who moved to the United States. Look, his name is Franz Boas. I was thinking, oh my God, but this is not, we didn't give the name to this scientist. He is a very important person in American anthropology. And we still analyze his work and all data with a new computer or something like that because he had some idea why he also noticed that people from, who come from one civilization to other civilization change uh, cephalic index. So his family name Boas is not related with the canine disease name Boas. In the veterinary medicine, we use the same terminology, brachycephaly, mesocephalic, and dolicocephalic. This terminology is a better to use mesocephalic, but in the most scientific literature, world medicine, use mesocephalic. This is typical classification of dog's head shape based on the cephalic index value. It's the same measurement like in the human medicine, so shorter is dog head is the higher cephalic index. I explained already. So we have several work who, um, who make research about uh, cephalic index. This is the one bulldog head um, post-mortem after for the research. And they measure, they measure many different things. And they find out that also the breadth of the, and the length can use, but for the point of the length of the head, they choose the tip of the nose. This is the red light and the green light. And they compare this and they call this cranial index. This is also group and this is uh, published in anatomic histology and embryology, uh, very basic journal in that research. When we are going more in scientific, uh, in the recent literature, we found this work from the Hungarian group from Budapest. Very nice work. They took this same index because they want to compare breeds 
between cephalic index and how they react with the stranger people. So, and they just found that the shorter headed dogs plus visually cooperative breeds, younger and playful dogs form eye contact faster with an unfamiliar, unfamiliar human. Probably could be reason why uh, those group of breeds also is popular. This is also um, very nice. If you have time, I always put the name of the article that you can read. It's a really good research uh, done with Hungarian colleague. Except cephalic index, also we have craniofacial ratio measured on the two different way. Some scientists measure the length of the head plus with the soft metal like a length of the skull on this way, but also we can also do what we see before, just from here to here as the length of the skull. Another work show us that probably will be enough to measure length of the head of the skull like this, because they see, they watch about CFF craniofacial angle that we see how space we have and how grow, how head growing toward or not in brachycephalic breeds. So they also have different, different, uh, uh, different numbers uh, compared with this angle in this, in this research. After all, we have during our selection, we have high variety of the head shape in the dogs. This is compared with the gray wolves. And then we see how we can vary through the, through the breeds. So brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome or BOAS, we also call this brachycephalic, oops, sorry. We also call brachycephalic syndrome, still in the literature, and the upper airway syndrome. I will explain. When somebody wants to publish the work, they, they send work to editor. Editor give to, to reviewers. If the reviewers suggest to change the name and to give the name, so it means that we still don't have conclusion how we will call this syndrome. So we use as a synonym, and the, even the recent work use the brachycephalic syndrome, but the most of the people when discuss about this syndrome, we call brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. If it's not related with brachycephalic type of breeds, we call upper airways syndrome. Why we call syndrome? Why we don't call disease? For example, we have similar disease in the horses and we call in the history uh, like COPD, obstructive disease, or something like that, they change and they split the disease. But because a syndrome may produce a number of symptoms without identifiable cause. That's the reason why we keep the word syndrome is this disease. When we put the word brachycephalic obstructive syndrome in the search in the PubMed, actually we have two big search engines engine in the science, scientific literature. One of this is a PubMed, another one is a web of science. And then if we put brachycephalic obstructive syndrome, we see that it's published 145 results in this. It means that this terminology is used in 145 articles. But when we watch, when we watch, oops, when we watch this diagram, it presents from 85 to 2022 what we can see, the number of article rise. So something is going wrong. And then what was interesting to see what's happened in the 85 and 91, because between there is nothing. And then we have two articles here. Go back to 91, it's uh, 31 years ago. We have fantastic art, actually, article from the Wikes 
published it uh, in the journal. He is, is not active anymore. And look, uh, the author called this syndrome brachycephalic airway obstructive syndrome. We just switch uh, two words later. And when you read just abstract, actually everything what is put in this abstract is, act, is actual today. That's amazing. For example, when I was in telemedicine, I was worked more with the telemedicine cases. Now I'm, I finish uh, uh, dermatology specialization. For example, atopic dermatitis, the most common disease in the canine world. We still, if you watch 91 in that time, we change so much. If you have psoriasis in the human medicine, so many billions we spend on the med medication. They already changed three times pathogenesis of disease. But our problem stays same. Only popularity and the publishing of article is changed. And when we go back to 85, this is the something what we can find in the digital mode, probably. There is some books or there is some articles who are not um, listed in these two uh, searching engines. But they, all, they call this is more surgery oriented, oriented uh, article. And they say, in our opinion, the stenotic nest can be pivotal or creating many of the problems that develop in brachycephalic patients. It, it's 85. When we this search in a different engine, we find 240 documents. And then when we put a little bit more uh, correct words, we can come to 64 in this. Prevalence and incidence across breeds. Big question. Actually, all published number failed. Failed because if we apply number what the published scientists of incidence and prevalence in the large and the cohort cannot be replied. So that's the reason why I, in the first slides I put some opinion of the, this is like more prediction than scientific work. The question is how many brachycephalic breeds suffer from BOAS? The, but it's difficult because we live in a different country. We have the different computer system when we denote this disease and nobody still has a large cohort like epidemiological study that we took one or two years and the brachycephalic breed and follow them through their life and see who will develop uh, uh, this, uh, syndrome or disease or not. So just incidence, the rate of the new cases of the disease occurring in this specific population, actually we can do that. But we need to have a large group, we need to have the, like a project who is designed and uh, of course approved by ethical committee of the country that we are, what we are doing. Actually, I asked my PhD students and I said, okay, I'm going to have some lecture about brachycephalic boas. So can you just take extract of all articles when we have more breeds? So they took all, when you will have this presentation in your computer, probably you can't see. This is the name of all articles. This is the number of animals in the scientific uh, articles. And this is the breed percentage out of this number of animals. What we can conclude from here we can conclude that French Bulldog, English Bulldog, and the Pug takes like a more than 95% distribution between um, sick, uh, sick dogs. And what, is, what was surprise for us? There is five or six brachycephalic breeds never, oops, again. They are even didn't mention in the scientific article but they are still victimized by some government and they are also an airplane company and they put like a brachycephalic breed and the list the breed that we don't know why. So if you, you know, we know that like we have different brachycephalic breed, but who decide 
why this breed is in the list prohibited to f fly on the plane. So this is the, this is the problem. And when people ask us and our scientific commission, can we list brachycephalic breed? And actually we don't have conclusion because we don't know what we will use as a, as a evidence-based medicine. Cephalic index plus relation of the muzzle, length of the muzzle and length of the skull. The recent review from 2020, they analyzed canine brachycephaly, anatomy, pathology, genetics, and welfare. And then they also find there, is, there are confirmation typical brachycephaly dogs that do not suffer even mild uh, boas. So it means that something is a different. We can always ask question and why this previous research failed. Because if you use as a control group in the research, same breed versus same uh, healthy breed, and the sick dogs from one breed, and the healthy dogs from other breed from the brachycephalic group. So we will have a problem interpre for interpretation the results. Let's speak quick about physiology of respiratory system. Respiratory system is a different, different part. And we, we start with nose, and then we are going to nasal cavity, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronch, and the spoly passageways, and the alveoles. We have exchange of the gas in the... I, have, I, I can hear something. Can you fix this? Okay, it's a better now. So we have this nose, like nose looks for us simple, but it's not so simple. It's a not epithel, hard epithel, nice colored, and because we have very sensitive cartilage who bring this shape of the nose and the open, open, open the nose. And by the way, one digression that I wake you up. Did you know this? Did you know the dogs can sense weak thermal radiation? There is a new research from 2020. So we would like to, we didn't know that, but also international European group did one research in the Budapest. And they, they find that war, the warm stimulus elicited increased neural response in the left somatosensory association cortex. What is interesting? Because the nose doesn't have only one function that, we, that okay, it's nice, it's, uh, we can watch as a dog show people, uh, pigmentation and the shape and everything. And also dog have to breathe through the open nostrils. But when you see this thermal camera, show us what we know, that our dogs has cold nose. We didn't know why, because when you see the ears of the dogs and all these periphery things, we see that the nose, nose is a much colder than the rest of the body. So we don't know what is the mechanism of the cooling the nose and then why. So, and then they do research that they put dog alive in the, in, in the magnet resonance and then put the stimuli, the warm stimuli, and then we have activation is this. Also the group from America, they discover this body of the nerves and they're also published in the same year, I think in the report of nature uh, about this. So nose is important for the dogs. Let's go more. Then we have the nose here and we have nasal cavity, which is a very complex. You know, for the human, when you have something or inflammation or deviation of the septum, your breathing is a difficult. Same here. And then we have this hard plate and then we have soft plate. And they divide nasal cavity from the oral cavity. And then I will show you more probably better in this. Please concentrate now. This is the nasal cavity here and the oral cavity is here. Usually when dog breathes, breathes to the nose. And when we take the photo or a show photo of the best in show, we always push the dog to close the mouth, even after running two rounds after. And then the air is coming here, going to larynx and then trachea. When dog running or has activity, even like a human people in the sport, they open the mouth, they need the more oxygen. So we have also oral cavity, 
and as the oropharynx and go, if, if we're going to food, going to esophagus, and if it's an open epiglottis, we can breathe and go uh, to this. This is important that you can see two systems, like respiratory and digestive system, we have here their crossroads. And then I will not go deeply. So we have that delivery oxygen and it's important. And then this is that little energy cost to the animal to breathe. Same for the human. When dogs stay, we don't feel the dog suffer or they try to do exhalation or inspiration. Oh, yesterday in uh, Mexico, look, I found a nice English bulldog bitch running with her owner on the bike. Yesterday was hot, warm day, and I was I like, look, this, is, this dog obviously not suffer from brachycephalic syndrome if he can run two to three kilometers on the bike on this weather. So, pathology of the boas, we have mis a misconfiguration of the respiratory soft tissue restriction flow. I mentioned what is the passageway of the normal. So, all part of this passageway can be blocked somehow. Even the macroglossia, like a big tongue, can obstruct oxygen for the normal uh, fluent system. So, consequently, boas affected dogs develop breathing difficulties, heat and exercise intolerance, and the more severe case, cyanosis and collapse. So, even we have passageway for the air, we have resistance. Because when you have resistance, there is also like some, the music instruments. Sometimes we can see or hear the sound just because we change, we change the volume from the one to the other, other part. And then in the boa, soft plate elongation, the thickening contributed to airflow of limitation too. Not only, not only stenotic nostrils, but stenotic nostrils play rule. We have in presentation and we have attempt of the non-scientist people to make nose, nose longer, and because they believe if nose is longer, that air can pass more, which is not true, actually. It's more important to open the nose. Doesn't matter how long a uh, muzzle it is, but the most important is that stenotic nostrils block the fluctuation of, of the air, and Look, risk of the boas increased 20 times in the French bulldog within moderate to severe uh, stenotic nostrils. So we have already two scientific teams work on this, and this is from Denmark, and they have they do particularly do on the French bulldogs, and they also make uh, different categorization like zero, one, two, three, like open, mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, nostrils. So just can you imagine this dog? How air can pass here? Impossible. Try to try to close your nose and try to breathe. It's a suffering. But if you little bit press your nose, what you can do, you also change the pressure of inhalation and exhalation. So also this is the from Professor Ludlow and the Liu uh, also the scheme which is a very many groups use this also, because Park, French Bulldog, and, and uh, English Bulldog, we said before, this is the free breeds really affected with boas. And then, when we know this table, we also ask, this is the patients from our clinic, they are not suffering from boas, they came from the different reason. So I just put the student and said, take the picture and make them categorization of the stenotic nostril through the picture. I just want to see how validated that veterinary students can, can give the good things. So we have overlap in the many results compare our clients who are not suffering from BOAS, but have different, different kind of steno, steno, nostril stenosis, especially this one. 
And then they group, of course, describe this and the article you can find here and you can read more, especially if you are a French bulldog breeder or the lover, I really suggest that you read this article. So we also have conclusion. The dogs with open airs are more likely to lead healthier life compared to dogs with open airs. When you have this conclusion, we, we don't need to wait. We need to start breed dog with an open nose. That's for sure. Let's explain, actually in airway physiology, they explain what's happened. So we have here one terrier. And then when, during inhalation, the, the, the pressure is a little bit negative. So you can see if you touch your nose and try make inspiration, you will feel this negative pressure. But on exhalation, there is a higher, so this pressure is a higher than atmospheric pressure. And then when we have brachycephalic breeds, when we have normal, healthy brachycephalic breeds, we can expect very similar scenario like this terrier. A little bit like uh, less pressure when we do like in the, in the nasal pharynx. But when we have obstructive disease, you can see effort and the air resistance through this narrow passage. And then we have negativity and then due uh, expiration, this is really effort to dog to push air, to push air out and uh, win to uh, air resistance. Same things happen in the pleural, alveolar and airway pressure. When we know that, it means the dog who has some kind of uh, obstacle in the passage little suffer. Because it's not what we say in physiology, there is a no effort to breathe. Just imagine, for example, when you have some flu, how we are tired when we cannot take and with inhalation, exhalation, how we lose the energy. And actually, during this, it's, we are not tired only because the virus or bacterial infection. Usually we are tired because we use the energy also for breathing. So we have, can we have sound now? So we have like three most important things here is a stertor, stridor, and displaya. If you hear this dog has a mix between stertor and stridor. Just explain because tomorrow I'm sure that Professor Lundlo will have this in the topic, I think. But I will just explain, like, snoring is when we are sleeping. Stertor is a word coming from that. But in the stertor, animal is up and awake. And then, usually, probably, something's happened in the front uh, airway passage, like a nose or something like that, and then, during inspiration, we see the sound. But when we see high-pitched sound, we call stridor. And this is extremely pathology event, extremely pathology event for the dogs. This is what we hear. You can, see, you can hear the dog suffering. He tried to inspiration and then expiration is a very, is, I can't say, very painful, but they use a lot of suffering. We also have this now. We can see this cavalier in charge spaniel. <laughs> we always have that. Is it brachycephalic or not brachycephalic? Okay, it's not brachycephalic, but still can have this now. And then you will see how the dog try, you need to try the swallowing, uh, something like that. Also, we, when we see that rib cage is working very hard to make expiration and inspiration is very bad, um, this patient was really like uh, on the final stage of the of, of the boa, and also later he developed other things. But I will discuss from the also secondary things uh, related with the boa. So this is nice paintings from that, that you can see that I just show you again what we said. We have hard plate, the soft plate, 
And this scenario, when we have the nasopharynx and across the road between uh, respiratory and uh, digestive things. So when we see when we see computer tomography CT, and we see one mesocephalic breeds, and this is the tube, this is the nose, and this is the mouth, and you see like a soft soft plate, and it looks soft plate in in this brachycephalic breed, and the big tongue. This is probably not only because it's a long. After all this suffering from inspiration and expiration, secondary we have inflammation. The, the tissue is irritated and became edematous. So it means that when we have brachycephalic sick dogs, we can expect that in the future, most of these symptoms will be worse. Actually, when we, I didn't mention that usually we in the clinics see brachycephalic uh, syndrome boas dogs between one and the three years. But sometimes we have that even Ovner didn't notice about uh, boas, and then we see the dog in the late stage of the disease with the five, six, or seven years, or when dogs uh, became heavy, we can see that uh, also later. So after that, we have this repeated injury and the pharyngeal muscles and the cosacant edema and the fibrosis and this muscle groups. So this is devastated and the chronic disease uh, for the dog. We have additional brachycephalic related problem. Why? Because we have low oxygen input. We, we have the dog who really try to breathe, even during the sleeping, try to find position how he can catch more air. And then we also have this gastrointestinal sign and the respiratory sign among with the boas. For example, this dog, what I explained, he aspirated food because during the vomiting and trying to breathe, the food is going on the wrong way and they go to the trachea. And this dog has a, unfortunately, a very bad prognosis. I just, I will not uh, speak about, the, uh, about uh, test because we have full hour tomorrow. So I, I escape this part of the lecture, lecture today. What's happened with one other breed, like a Norwich Terrier, uh, this is kind of the happy solution because they have obstructed airway syndrome. They, they are, we can say this, they are mesocephalic breed with tendency to brachycephalic because they nose could be a little bit shorter more and more. But they found, they found the gene, and the, when they use genetic test, what we listen today, we can escape from this uh, syndrome, and this is the good. So in this work, they explain affected dogs and unaffected dogs, and to see how little space was for the air to pass and exchange oxygen. Breeding strategy, plan suggested by scientists, we don't have many works about that. We need to work together with scientists. And I really suggest to the uh, Breeders Club to work with a scientific group who is working on the boas. This one, it was not like a big number of dogs, but also significant. They calculated all this, what uh, two teams calculated, like Cambridge team and the Copenhagen team. They calculated what is the most important things that we can avoid uh, uh, boas. And then what they conclude, they conclude that if we use the dog who doesn't possess conformation things like stenotic nostrils, like elongated soft plate, uh, or very thick neck, or the heavy body that we can escape uh, this disease, but also they, they, they show here statistical analysis what factor in the French bulldog uh, can uh, help us in the future breeding that we can save the breed from this devastating, devastating disease. 
And then for the final, I didn't have conclusion for this because you can make conclusion. I will just ask some question from the position of the breeders. Breeders can ask, who can diagnose this Boas? I can tell you only veterinarian because we can do tests, we can do everything, but there is some differential diagnosis who can make temporarily uh, lower ability to dog to breathe normally or to make strange sound. We have some cases on the dog show that some French bulldog came to ring and produce very strange sound. And then we disqualify, of course, dog, and then dogs come after and then without any symptoms. So probably it was some inflammation that owner couldn't handle it or, or didn't know that. So before we disqualify dog from the breathing system, veterinarian must sign that, that this is dog has brachys of boas, that suffer from boas, because the boas is a chronic disease and we don't expect without surgery or some new medication um, approach that the dog can be better because the notic nostrils, elongated plate will not disappear alone. Is it possible to use dog affected with boas in the breeding program? Big no, don't do that. It must be strictly forbidden. There is a different country with different strategies. In the same country, we have the breeding examination and the same country, we have very liberal uh, breeding system. In this, for this disease is not good because if breeder, if breeder is not going to the vet check, still continue breeding with uh, boas. What I predispose breeders can do prevent boas from upcoming generation? Talk with the club, talk with the veterinarian. They will inform you what you can do that you can still breed healthy dogs without mix them with the other, other breeds. And the question from judges, what we can ask after, after what we know, how do I judge dogs with stenotic nostrils? We will do some uh, welfare committees working with Dr. Pyro about this. And I'm thinking that soon we will, we will have this guideline for the judges, how we can do. And I'm sure that this uh, severe stenotic nostrils will be directly disqualification. Doesn't matter because stenotic nostrils cannot be viral induced or bacterial induced. They will be automatically. And then, but the Danish group, what I said us, if we exclude from the breeding moderate and severe stenotic nostrils in the French Bulldog, we will lose more than 50% breeding stock. What it means? It means that already affected breeds with some other condition, we will reduce genetic pool. So we must be very careful and it will be long work. We cannot expect that we will clean boas from French Bulldog or one or two generation. Probably we need three, four, five generation, but very hard work between breeders, kennel club and veterinarian organization. What I can do when I hear strange noise of dog during judging and the movement in the ring? Sure, excuse cannot be judged. Don't give diagnosis in the ring. That's not our job. Even I'm wet, I never give the diagnosis. I see so many things in the ring, but I never try to be wet in the ring. You can advise owner handler to ask veterinary help. We always have one veter veterinarian uh, present on the dog show, and this veterinarian will help and tell us what we can do uh, to help this dog and to see which team is, is working close that we can in this dog send and give them the right diagnosis. How do I approach to obese dogs in the show ring and the breeding test? Well, we know that also when we have the really obese pack, they also start with the difficult breathing and something like that. And then we need to really be careful. We need the obesity is a kind of disease. We is condition which is prone to many other disease. So we need to also advise people to keep dog fit. So I'm, I'm am I on time, Dopi? No, no, oh, that's the last slide. So thank you very much. This is also for the skulls and the Katarina. Okay, as a judge, 
as a judge. Many of these biographers of Aldrich breeds. As a judge, many of these biographers of Aldrich breeds I judge. And sometimes I often hear breathing hard. As you said, you should not diagnose it, nothing. So what should I do? If I hear the dog breathing, sometimes I even put the dog beside me and listen. It goes. Yeah, if you, I, I, I know you are not veterinarian, but if it's only during inspiration, or it's only on the few seconds when dog is a very ex exciting and then stop and the, the around the running, brief normally or something like that, you know, I would like to wait and see if continue dog, especially in the running, you, fe you feel strange noise. I don't think so that you, this dog can be awarded. Sure. You know, this is like cannot be judged is the best way because you cannot make even you are experienced breeder because, but if you see high pitch in any time, you know what we see here, this is, we just send the dog, this, nothing can help. Yes, know. because um, when we judge dogs, many of the brachocephalic breeds yeah. are quiet. Whatever they run, they're quiet. Yeah. But some dogs, even when you, let's say, you put them, you hear something, so you, you put your ear close to their, close to their breathing and hear the <laughs> yeah. We, I sometimes I hear not only fre only brachycephalic breeds in the rig, I see also mesocephalic. For example, my miniature schnauzers, they are hiking dogs. And when we approach to the parking spot on the mountain, they start produce such a strange noises of, because they are so exciting that they are going to hiking that I also make a video of this, but I didn't want to put my dogs here because everybody think that I breed a <laughs> sick dog. No, it was just sound. And then of course, when I opened the car, they stopped because they were exciting. But uh, this sound, when you hear in the ring, it's not good, especially the brachycephalic breeds. Try to observe nostrils. If you, hear, if you have moderate and severe nostrils and any kind of even the light sound, I don't want this, this type of the dog is not for dog show. Yeah. Okay, more questions. Hello, I have a question. There's an anatomical feature uh, in brachycephalic breeds that I wonder, I don't see it discussed when we're talking about Boaz, but I wonder whether it also has an impact and that's the width of the jaw. Can you repeat what? Whether the width of the jaw for brachycephalic breeds also has an impact on Boaz. Everything, everything on the passageway has impact. Because I, I'm a breeder of bulldogs. And <laughs> I know that you. <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I see more problems with narrowness of the jaw than I do with some of the width to the jaw. Yeah. And I don't see that discussed in any studies and I was wondering whether that's looked But at. probably in the English Bulldogs, uh, when we have the narrow jaws, but we have more often in the ring, when we watch the English Bulldog from the face, we have very few dogs that we have the wide under jaw or something like that. And then the, also the, I think that the problem is the tongue in that, because when we have the narrow jaw, the tongue doesn't have a place to stay the normally. And if you, when we judge, English Bulldog, when we open the mouth, you, you open many mouths. So can you see sometimes that even you can't see the, the teeth and, uh, from the tongue, how it take this place of this. Of course, when we have the big tongue and the very narrow jaw, that we have the obstacle in the oral cavity. I have a, I have a question, oh, by the way, great presentation, thank you. I have a question on the semantics and the language. So in your literature review, you talked about even within the literature, one term has not completely taken over yet. But when we use the term BOAS and we put the brachycephalic in front of it, when we know that there are brachycephalic dogs that do not have the syndrome, and, you, and there's mesocephalic dogs that have the syndrome, do we... Do we create a, a problem for ourselves that the brachycephalic, which is really not related to disease or the syndrome directly, just, just an just a adjective, if you will, 
does that then create this negative perception for all brachycephalic breeds when there may not be either a breed or a, or a particular dog uh, disease? Yeah, when we know anatomy of the respiratory system and uh, any, any dogs can suffer from obstructive. In the human medicine, it's a huge problem. In the human medicine, they have more research about obstructive syndrome and then also try to find, uh, and then we have also problem with apnea during, during sleeping and everything. But as we have three very popular brachycephalic breeds, even we call this disease obstruct obstructive airway syndrome, we can use it because the first scientific word used that word. In my, in my specialization in dermatology, when first scientists describe the disease and give the name, there is no way that we will change the name of the disease only in the way that we change dramatically pathogenesis of disease. For example, we have alopecia X in Pomeranian and all the Nordic breeds. Professor Dennis Scott, the famous dermatologist from Cornell, he didn't know, he couldn't find reason what is that. And he put the name alopecia X. And then we, after 30 years of research, we have many hormones and enzyme implying this disease in the different breeds. And then Professor Scott, after 30 years, came to lecture in the Europe and he said, guys, it's a time to change the name of disease. You know what we say? No, <laughs> you know. So this is, this is the scientists, the group of the scientists. We already have three na different names of disease. And we know that in the horse medicine, they change obstructive disease and they split with the two disease, like a young horse who suffer from asthma, like a year old or something, and then older horse with obstructive disease. So in the future, when we have more research, largest cohort, and, and, and the more observation, why? for example, the biggest question is what we did wrong with the breeding program. How it's happened that we have highest amount of the free breeds compared with the 12 other brachycephalic breeds that don't have issue. So that's the issue, how we can call this obstructive airway syndrome on the, in the future, when you find something or gene or whatever's happened, or when we completely change breeding strategy and they put lighter dogs you know, with a little bit more elegant necks, with the open nostrils, probably we can correct things without using other breed in the program. Uh, sorry, this has to be the last question because we are running late. Okay. Um, so if you can make it fast. And then anyone else who's got other questions, please come and look for Nick Sino. I've got like 20 questions for him myself. Um, so look for him later and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions. <laughs> Okay, just a short one. Um, as a veterinarian, um, when you're operating on Boas dogs, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry, when you're operating on Boas dogs, sometimes you'll find some dogs can't open their mouths very wide at all. They're quite limited in their opening, and you can only open the door about that wide. Does that add to the problem? Instead of wide open. Which breed you have? French Bulldog. Ah, French Bulldog. Well, the brachycephalic breeds has a very, like, um, what, we, what, we see, what we see in this uh, radiology study, radiology study, the position of, of the underjaw, uh, underjaw joint or something like that. For us, when we, when we do dermatology examination, when we do open and, and watch mucose and something like that, in the most brachycephalic breeds, you cannot open jaws like what you can do with dolicocephalic or mesocephalic breeds. We, because you see the, on this is the photo, there is, the, this jaw doesn't have this angle that you can do that, but like a full mouth, yes. I want to thank the FCI board members for giving Mexico the opportunity of having this important World Congress for Welfare and Health for the Dogs Worldwide. We are really pleased and thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity. And also I want to thank all the speakers from all over the world who participate 
in this great event. Thank you.